it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I would like to thank uh, the financial support from ACMs and uh, the Swiss National Science Foundation. This is joint work with uh, some uh, physicists, uh, Michele, Elena and Alessandro, uh, and then uh, some statisticians, uh, Francesco and another Michele. So um, the topic of the talk is uh, Bayesian modeling and algorithms for identifying the intrinsic dimension uh, of heterogeneous data. And we will focus on some health applications. So what is this intrinsic dimension? It is well known that uh, a small number of variables is often sufficient to effectively describe high dimensional data. And uh, this uh, number is called the intrinsic dimension of the data. What is uh, less commonly known is that this intrinsic dimension can vary within the same data set. So what we do here um, uh, in this uh, research line is develop a simple and robust approach to cluster region within, this, uh, within the same uh, data set that have a similar uh, local intrinsic dimension. And surprisingly, we find that many real world data set contain regions with very heterogeneous uh, intrinsic dimension. And these regions uh, host points that differ in core properties. And today I will uh, talk about um, protein uh, configurations. And we'll see that um, proteins that are folded versus unfolded have different intrinsic dimension. I will then consider brain imaging fMRI data, and again, active and not active regions in the brain have different intrinsic dimension. Uh, then, uh, if I have time, I will look at uh, non-health uh, applications, like we have uh, companies, and we look at their balance sheets, and we find that companies that have different risk uh, attitudes have different intrinsic dimension. Uh, and finally, uh, some MCMC, um, simulation. We look at the output of MCMC, uh, um, Markov chain path, and uh, we identify uh, that models that have uh, different intrinsic dimension in their MCMC path might have uh, identifiability issues. So what's interesting uh, at the end of the day is that a simple topological feature like the intrinsic dimension, uncovers a very rich structure in the data. So this is the core message. So uh, let's go uh, towards a more formal definition of what this intrinsic dimension is. So suppose you have a, a set of data points in capital D coordinates. The intrinsic dimension, which I will um, indicate with lowercase d, is the minimum number of dimension required to describe the data while still uh, minimizing the loss of information when we summarize the data through this uh, small set of coordinates. So there are many methods that are used in the literature to identify the intrinsic dimension, and many of them uh, use the fact that if you look at the number of neighbors of a given point xi within a certain distance r, and we call this number of neighbor capital N for point i at distance r, this number scales, uh, of course, with the distance r, with the density of the uh, data evaluated at the point xi, and also with d, the intrinsic dimension. So there's this relationship between this summary of the data and the intrinsic dimension that we can use to estimate uh, the intrinsic dimension of the data. So why is this intrinsic dimension useful? Well, um, essentially the intrinsic dimension is the number of independent direction of variation of the data. And often this is lower than the original dimension of the data. So suppose you have data in a 3D uh, uh, space, so capital D is 3 in this picture, but the data is really lined up on a surface <laughs> of dimension 2. So in this case, lowercase d is 2. Well, if we look at the data in this two-dimensional uh, manifold, uh, 
we can improve our statistical analysis. For example, suppose we are classifying the data. Well, we know that working in high dimension is hard, but if we identify that the data really lives on a smaller dimensional manifold, or our, our statistical inference will be uh, much easier because we reduce the dimensionality of the problem. So looking at this uh, uh, manifold of dimension two, in this specific image, uh, identifies uh, the hypersurface of lower dimension where the points are constrained to leave. And the density of the points should be really evaluated over this uh, sub-manifold. But how do, I, how do we identify this intrinsic dimension? I will um, start with a toy example, which is the iris data set that we all know. So we have three types of iris flowers, and uh, we record four variables, the length and the width of the petal and the sepal. So the original dimension of the data here is not big, is four. Uh, and we will see that uh, uh, the setosa uh, variety of flower really lives on a four dimensional uh, space, while the other two type of uh, iris live on a manifold of dimension uh, smaller than four. So their intrinsic dimension is smaller. So here at the end of our analysis, just by looking at the intrinsic dimension of the data and forgetting that those are different type of flowers, we managed to uh, identify the different species looking at their intrinsic dimension. We do a similar uh, job with uh, protein folding. So we consider 31,000 configuration of a protein undergoing successive folding and unfolding cycles the protein performs approximately 10 transition between the folded and the unfolded state. Uh, we have used the longest available simulated trajectory of a protein uh, that comes from a paper published in Science fairly recently. And as you can see, the protein cannot take any configuration. So the data really lives in uh, three times n uh, space because for each atom in the protein, we record the three coordinates in space, and we have capital N atoms. But really, the data cannot take all the possible configuration in R times 3N, but only a subset of possible configurations can be taken by the protein, and this is what we call the intrinsic dimension. Um, similarly, if you look at the handwritten digit 2, the, uh, uh, which we look at on a 20 by 20 uh, pixel grid, well, again, the data is not really living on a 20 by 20 uh, dimensional space because if the digit is two, not all possible configuration can be taken uh, by uh, the digit. And this is, again, the intrinsic dimension of the data. And uh, on the right-hand side, you have uh, images, a face that is rotating, and again, the original data lives on a 64 times 64 grid on a, a, a scale of grays. But it, w since we know that this is a face that is rotating, not all possible configurations are really available. So the intrinsic dimension identifies the number of possible configurations that the data can really take. So. Uh, let's look at uh, an, an abstract image. Suppose the data is this uh, spiral. If you look at the uh, old data set, you realize that the data is uh, in dimension two, so capital D is two, but there's an, there's an issue related also to the subset of the data that you get to see. Because if you get to see uh, what is um, in the up left corner of the image, the data really seems to um, be lined up on a dimensional one line. So uh, similarly, if you look at the data uh, in a, a, a smaller subset, as in the panel B, again, the data seems to be in dimension two. Or if you have an even smaller subset of the data, just a single point, then the data seems to be in dimension zero. So. There's an issue related to uh, the intrinsic dimension and the sample of the data that you get to see. 
So if you get to see the old picture, a subset or even an even smaller subset, uh, you might get a different idea of what the intrinsic dimension of the data is. So if we relate the intrinsic dimension as a function of uh, the sample size, uh, here we have a simulated two-dimensional Gaussian uh, wrapped on a Swiss roll and embedded in a 30-dimensional space with added noise. Well, depending on the noise that you add and depending on the sample size, this is the plot on the horizontal line, you have the sample size that you get to observe the data, and on the vertical line, you have the intrinsic dimension. The three different colors of the, um, of the lines relate to three different levels of noise, from low noise to higher level of noise. Again, depending on the sample size that you get to see of the data, you get a different idea of the intrinsic dimension of the data, which is really two. But uh, if you get larger and larger samples with noisier and noisier observation, you get a false idea of what the intrinsic <laughs> dimension is. So identifying the intrinsic dimension is a hard problem because it's related to the sample size and the noise uh, level that you get to observe your data. So what are the uh, current uh, available methodology in the literature? Well, from a projective perspective, um, it can take your data, which lives on R capital D, and project it down to R lowercase d. And you can use different projection um, and uh, evaluate the loss function that you have in mind. It could be a loss function that aims at preserving the original distance relationships between points, like an L2 distance, or you might want to preserve the original covariance matrix uh, of the point. And uh, you try to project uh, on different uh, lower case D and uh, try to balance the trade-off between the dimensionality reduction, that is D, and the loss function. Well, this methodology of finding the intrinsic dimension uh, through different uh, type of projection is computationally intensive because you search for the optimal projection for each value of D. And... Um, is not very robust. For example, when you do principal component analysis, here you have a, a, a loss function. You try to uh, preserve, uh, to, to project your data onto the subspace spanned by the first D eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, and you try to find the optimal D. Well, if you uh, plot uh, D on the horizontal line and the loss function on the vertical line, uh, and you get a plot like the one in the figure, is how it's hard to tell uh, what is the intrinsic dimension because you don't see a gap uh, in, in this plot. So the question is, how can we select uh, an appropriate uh, intrinsic dimension in the data? Well, we try a statistical uh, approach. And we go back to the original uh, uh, relationship um, that I show you on the first slide. So uh, rho is the density distribution of points, and there is this relationship that relates the number of points at distance r from a given point i to the distance, the density of points, and the intrinsic dimension. So if we have... Uh, okay, so here's the relationship. So if we assume that rho is constant, then, using uh, this uh, number of points within distance r can lead to an estimate of d by a simple linear fit. But the assumption that rho is constant is a very strong assumption. Still, uh, suppose we uh, can assume then that uh, there is a method that is called the two nearest neighbor method, um, that was published in uh, uh, scientific reports by a subset of the colleagues uh, with whom I'm collaborating, uh, that says, well, instead of looking at uh, the quantity nr, which depends on rho, let's look at a different statistics, a different summary of the data. In particular, let's look at the ratio between the distance of every point to its 
closest neighbor and the second closest neighbor. So we call this quantity mu i. So for point i, mu i is the ratio between the distance of i to the second uh, closest neighbor and uh, the distance to the uh, first closest neighbor. Now, uh, in this paper, they prove that uh, the distribution of this summary of the data, mu i, only depends on the intrinsic dimension d and does not depend on rho anymore. So it's independent on the density of the data. So using this relationship now, they go on and estimate uh, through either uh, fit the cumulative distribution function or uh, do a linear fit on the log scale and estimate mu through uh, this um, relationship. The only assumption is that rho is constant on the scale of the first two neighbors. So does not need to be constant overall, but only on the scale of the first two neighbors. Now, if this assumption holds, this method works perfectly. But if the intrinsic dimension is not unif uniform in the data set, then uh, we are in trouble. So for example, suppose your data uh, is uh, mixture of points living of manifold of smaller dimensions but different among them. So here I have a subset of points that live on a manifold with dimension 2, another subset that lives on a manifold of dimension 3, and yet another one that still lives on a manifold of dimension 2 but with a slightly different orientation. So the original point live in a three-dimensional space and I have three sub-manifolds with different dimension each. Now, in this setting, that method uh, fails. And here is uh, where my contribution to this research line um, started to play a role. So if we assume that rho is constant on the scale of the first two neighbors um, within the same manifold, and that we have uh, k manifolds, each one of dimension di, then we can uh, assume that the density of the points is a mixture of uh, k components uh, where within each manifold we go back to the Pareto distribution. So we have a mixture of Pareto distribution with mixing probability given by pk. Now, for statisticians, uh, this is a fairly simple uh, model and fairly simple to estimate we can uh, uh, write down the likelihood of the, of the data, assuming that the data is independent. Uh, so the, the, under, uh, the unknown variables is uh, the mixture proportions and the intrinsic dimension of each one of the k sub-manifolds. So we can either take a frequentist approach and do a maximum likelihood, but uh, as a Bayesian, uh, I'd rather put a prior distribution on D and P, the two parameters, come out with a posterior distribution, and then uh, do some MCMC simulation. We use the uh, standard trick of introducing latent variables in mixture models. So the Z are the uh, latent variables. We have one for each point in the data set. So zi equal to k means that the ith point belongs to the kth uh, manifold. And so now we want to jointly estimate uh, d, the intrinsic dimension, p, the proportion in the mixture, and z, the latent variables identifying which points belongs to which manifold. Now, this seems very nice, but it doesn't work. Uh, the reason why it doesn't work uh, can be uh, highlighted in this uh, simple simulation study. Here we have uh, a mixture of two Gaussians. The first one lives on a, a manifold of dimension 4, and the second one either lives on a manifold of dimension 5, 6, 8, uh, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Okay? So it's two Gaussian. The first one is, one, uh, is uh, dimension 4, so the intrinsic dimension of points coming from the first Gaussian is four, and then we have the other ones. Now, um, in this case, uh, we do a bad job uh, identifying the two intrinsic dimensions. So D1 is uh, four, and that's correct. D2 should be 
five, six, seven, eight, and nine, the red dots do not line up on the red line as they should. Um, so to overcome this issue, um, which is due to the fact that uh, the Pareto distribution with different D parameter uh, are highly overlapping. So it is difficult to assign a point only based on this mu, which is the ratio, remember, between the first and second neighbor. Uh, in order to overcome this, we must assume that manifolds are separated with, at most, a small intersection. Otherwise, we won't be able to identify those manifolds. And the way we do this formally is adding another summary of the data. So. The new summary of the data is uh, we count the number of neighbors with the same membership uh, variable uh, for each point i and the number of neighbors of the point i with a different membership. So the number of neighbors that belong to the same manifold and the number of neighbors that belong to a different uh, manifold. And uh, so we assume that the first q neighbors of a point mostly belong to the same manifold which means that the distribution of this uh, number of neighbors with the same um, manifold membership is a Bernoulli distribution with uh, success probability, probability of being in the same neighbor, which is bigger than a half. So adding this bit uh, to our likelihood um, allows us to properly identify, so we went back to the simulated data before, and now we do a good job. So we identify well the first manifold that has dimension two, and the second one that has dimension, depending on the simulation, five, six, seven, or eight. So uh, with this additional bit in the likelihood, we now do a good job um, identifying situations like uh, this one. So let's go back to uh, the motivating examples. Uh, what we see is in the molecular dynamic setting, Remember, we have uh, a protein that goes from the folded to the unfolded states. Uh, the original data lives in dimension 32. Well, we identify four sub-manifolds of much smaller dimensions. Uh, the first three of dimension 12, 13 point something, and 13 point something else. Um, and the last manifold has a much higher dimension, 23. Now. What's interesting is that the folded state, so the protein in the folded state, typically belongs to the higher dimensional uh, manifold, which does have uh, uh, an interesting and intuitive interpretation. But what's uh, remarkable is that we uncover a feature of the protein that is being in a folded versus an unfolded state just by looking at this intrinsic dimension, which is a geometric feature of the data. <laughs> and we do a similar thing with uh, data from the brain. So we have 30,000 time series uh, from fMRI experiments. The person um, is doing a task, a visual module uh, task. And we have uh, 20, uh, 30, 202 voxel in the brain while the person is doing this task. Again, we identify uh, two manifolds, one of dimension 16 and one of dimension uh, 32. And what's interesting is that the voxel that are known to be uh, doing um, jointly activated when the person is doing that specific task, they uh, most of them belong to the manifold of higher intrinsic dimension. So again, just by looking at geometric feature of the data, we uncover an interesting structure, which is which are the voxels that are coherently doing or activated when doing performing this uh, specific task. Uh, well, I'll skip the example related to uh, the, the, the companies. Um, but let me uh, tell you uh, about uh, one of the latest development, uh, which is a Bayesian nonparametric extension of this approach. So remember, um, up to now, k, the number of manifolds, uh, was uh, fixed ahead of time. Of course, we can do inference on uh, the true number of uh, manifolds by doing, uh, for example, model selection through BIC. 
but um, uh, suppose now we let k, the number of manifolds, go to infinity. This brings us to a Bayesian nonparametric approach. So instead of having a mixture of k uh, components, we now have an infinite mixture of uh, Pareto distribution, where the parameter of the Pareto distribution is the intrinsic dimension. So we, um, this brings us uh, to a Dirichlet process uh, uh, mixture model which uh, has the usual um, you know, representation as a hierarchical model. The mu i, which are the ratio between the first and second neighbor uh, distances, is again a Pareto distribution. Di, the intrinsic dimension, as an unknown distribution, which we assume to be a Dirichlet process, uh, with, um, uh, which is centered around a gamma distribution. And we center the Dirichlet process on the gamma distribution because the gamma is conjugate with the Pareto distribution. So um, we can exploit uh, conjugacy. Again, we introduce uh, the latent variables um, and we use a stick breaking representation of the Dirichlet process. And let's go back to the uh, uh, toy example, the iris uh, data set. Um, and we, just by looking at this intrinsic dimension, we identify uh, the three species of flower uh, fairly clearly, and it turns out that the uh, setosa type of flowers really live on uh, a four-dimensional space. So the intrinsic dimension of uh, the setosa iris is really D as the original uh, data set. So, while the other two types of flowers, the versicolors and the virginica, um, have an intrinsic dimension which is around three. So it's smaller than the original one. So again, uh, using the intrinsic dimension, we can identify uh, the different variety of uh, iris flowers without um, imposing um, anything else on the model but the fact that we look at the distances between the first and second neighbors. So we only need a distance measure uh, between points uh, in, the, in, the, in the data set. And uh, finally, just because Anna, I'm, I've been doing MCMC uh, for the past 20 years, we uh, use this uh, idea of intrinsic dimension, uh, find the intrinsic dimension of the path of a Markov chain that, is, um, that has uh, two models as their stationary distribution. So we have a Bayesian linear regression. The first model has four explanatory variables. The second model is in some sense ill-posed because it has two constant and twice uh, the variable uh, two. Okay, so um, what we see is uh, by using our methodology, which we called Hidalgo, that's a nice uh, methodology, uh, it's, it's a na name that, that we like, hierarchical uh, intrinsic dimension uh, uh, identification. Uh, we see that uh, the intrinsic dimension of the uh, Markov chain path running on the uh, first model is really five. The first model is well identified while the intrinsic dimension, the posterior distribution of the intrinsic dimension uh, for the second model that really has three independent variables is three or is centered around three. So again, just by looking at this intrinsic dimension um, that we compute on the MCMC output uh, of a Markov chain targeting two different models, one which is well identified, which has five uh, explanatory variables, and one which is poorly identified, uh, we sort of see this identifiability uh, issue. So, um, well, we have uh, some more simulated data, but I will skip this and uh, let me get to um, the conclusion. So, uh, we study the uh, issue of identifying the intrinsic dimension we start with this uh, two nearest neighbor uh, approach that has uh, a limit because it assumes that the density is, um, the, the intrinsic dimension is constant over the entire data set. Uh, 
we overcome this issue by going uh, from a single Pareto distribution to a mixture of Pareto distribution, and then we go from a Bayesian to a Bayesian nonparametric uh, by taking this mixture to, of K uh, uh, manifold to an infinite mixture, um, taking a Dirichlet process approach. Thank you.